Are you always coming up with ideas? Do you marvel at successful business owners? Do you hate being told what to do? Ever take things apart just to see how they work? Are you a dreamer? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. But first, a word from our sponsor. Tapes and Specialties is the world leader in tape manufacturing and specialty conversion with over 40 years of experience. In addition to our pro brand of high quality specialty adhesive tapes, we provide contract converting services that help improve your profitability, streamline your supply chain, and reduce inventory cost. We offer the most complete range of converting capabilities in the industry, such as cloth tape, double coated tape, specialty tape, paper tape, masking tape, vinyl tape, carton sealing tape, adhesive transfer tape, duct tape, phone tape, electrical tape, filament tape, foil tape, reflective tape. And the tape just keeps on rolling. Visit us online today at www.protapes.com or call us at 800-345-0234. Pro Tapes, it's just how we roll. Welcome, my name is Kevin Wortham. I'm here today with my friend, my pastor, Rupert Hall. How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you, <laughs> Kevin. Glad so, to be here. So when we were uh, preparing for this, we said we were going to keep this uh, natural and organic. Correct. And so we wanted to we want, we want to highlight some things, right? So the first thing that we want to highlight is your involvement with the Poor People's Campaign. What is that? What's your involvement? And how is that going to benefit the city of Trenton and our church? Well, first off, my involvement with the Poor People's Campaign started, I would say, just prior to COVID. Okay. Uh, it was at that time that uh, Dr. Barber and Pastor Liz, they had encouraged the, the various state organizations okay. to go to the state capitol um, for a six-week period okay. to bring the issues concerning poor and low-income people to bear. Gotcha. So every Monday for six consecutive weeks um, before going to the uh, Capitol on State Street, they would congregate at Turning Point at okay. 15 South Broad Street. Yes. Uh, they would start there and at the end of the day they would come back and pick up their things. So okay. uh, fast forward to uh, June of 2023, uh, I was invited to attend the uh, conference of the Moral, uh, the Moral Action Congress uh, with Dr. Barber in okay. Washington, D.C. for a four-day period. Okay. And uh, there were people there from all over the country uh, of the Poor People's Campaign. I was able to see firsthand what Dr. Barber was doing. Okay. Um, it was at that time I, I recognized that Dr. Barber uh, picked up the baton from Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay. Uh, Dr. King was working on a Poor People's March just prior to his, prior to his assassination. Okay. But Dr. Barber has picked that up, and I was encouraged because when we talk about celebrating Martin Luther King and his legacy, all too often in, in recent years, it's been reduced to picking up trash okay. as a day of service. Wow. But Dr. King's focus was a lot more than that. Dr. King's uh, focus, especially uh, in his last speech, uh, was about economic justice okay. and economic empowerment and understanding that while racism is a, a key, but more so than racism, there was an economic racism, if you will. Okay. Um, the, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. Yes. And poverty has no color. Okay. You know, that sort of thing. Now, so you, you talk about the Poor People's Campaign. What's, where's the threshold in terms of what's considered poor? And how many, how many poor people are there in our country? The um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they use a number of about 29 million. Uh, <laughs> it's a calculation uh, that was emanated out of the Depression area. Okay. Uh, our research shows that the actual number is about 140 million people who are either poor oh. or low income. Okay. Uh, that is calculated on the basis that there are so many people who are one check, one paycheck away. Yep 
from being on the soup line? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or or a, a financial emergency. Yes. Uh, from being uh, in financial straits. Okay. And um, the uh, this this is what I found very critical. We hear a lot of talk about a minimum wage, a yes. fifteen dollar minimum wage. Yes. Uh, here in New Jersey, it's been calculated that a minimum wage. A livable wage, yes. a livable wage for a family of four, okay. with a, a moderate rent of twelve hundred, which is still low, yes, uh, is thirty dollars an hour. Whoa! So, you know, we suggest, and our research shows that there are one hundred and forty million people in yes. America who are in poverty. Yes. Now, let me ask this question: So, with the Poor People's Campaign. Is there a big movement or march coming up soon that we should know about that you're participating in? Sure. On March 2nd, okay. uh, in 30 state capitals, there will yes. be a rally uh, where we will be congregating at the doorsteps okay. of the state capitals in 30, 30 different states okay. where we are going to bring to bear uh, the issues of poor and low-income people. Okay. And we're going to talk about the the issues surrounding not just the monetary part, okay. but also uh, racism, um, the fact that too much of our government's budget is in the military. Yes, uh, we're going to talk about economic. I'm, I'm sorry, ecological okay. um, uh, injustices where, okay. in too often in our inner cities, especially especially a city like Trenton, which was a heavy manufacturing yes. town. The ground is polluted with mercury, with yes. a whole lot of chemicals. Um, the the aging infrastructure was full of, of lead pipes and, okay. and that sort of thing. We're going to also talk about the need for health care. Okay. Um, during the pandemic, we saw an expansion of Medicaid. And once um, the pandemic ceased, those benefits were terminated. Gotcha. And our position is if you could offer then, why can't you still offer it? Because there's... There's enough money in America. Okay. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, what is a priority. Now, you know, it, it, it seems like you're doing a lot of heavy lifting. Who's on the team with you, Pastor? Who's on the team? Right now, each state is required, is suggested that we okay. have a, what we refer to as a coordinating committee. Okay. Of a minimum of 30 people. Okay. In New Jersey, we were a little bit behind the eight ball. In June, for instance, when I went to Washington, D.C., states like Texas and Alabama, even Massachusetts, okay. they had at least 25 people as part of the coordinating okay. committee that yes. were in attendance. New Jersey had five. <laughs> okay, got you. New Jersey had five. Okay. I strike that. Six. Okay. Six. Okay. Um, here in New Jersey, we have been recruiting, not just for the lead up to the March 2nd rally, okay. but after March 2nd, um, here in New Jersey, we're going to be very active in, in keeping the light on uh, the issues of the poor and low income. Okay. So right now, that, that number of five or six, we're close to 20 now. Okay. Now, how is Trenton's leadership, like the mayor and his administration, Right, and some of the city council, how are they responding to you in, in this capacity? Well, in this capacity, while most of my focus has been on prep in preparation for the uh, the camp, the, the march and the yes. rally, uh, I have not uh, approached the city council. Okay. We have not approached the uh, the mayor with regards to these issues. Okay. We're trusting that maybe on March 2nd they will be there and okay. that will serve as a platform for okay. continuing dialogue. Okay. No. By, um, uh, no, go ahead, Pastor. I'm sorry. While we have different areas of uh, indicia of poverty, uh, my personal focus uh, is twofold. Number one, housing. Yes. And voter registration. Gotcha. Uh, we're finding uh, across the country that low uh, income persons have a low percentage of voter registration. Okay. And low percentage of voter involvement in actual voting. Gotcha. And it's our belief, it's, it's proven that if we can coalesce people that don't vote. Yes. And they don't see a need to vote. Yes. Understand that uh, as poor and low income people, if you start voting in a block, policy change could happen. Gotcha. Now, I want to stop you for a second because you said something interesting. You talked about housing. Yes. And you knew we were going to talk about this. You are the president of the Kingsbury Tower. 
Uh, share with us about that. Talk to us about that. What, what's that about, and, and what's your and what's your leadership capacity for? Well, um, for for three years, I've been president of the Kingsbury Corporation, which sole asset is the Kingsbury Towers. Yes, uh, it's about a fifty-one year old um, housing development. Yes, um, it's it serves as the number one project of the New Jersey Mortgage and Housing Finance Agency wow. in the early 70s and late 60s. Meaning that was their first project that they first did? First project. Wow. About two and a half years ago, the management company that had been there for about 50 years. Yeah. Left. And since that time, the board, which heretofore had just what I refer to as a go-to-dinner board, we yeah. would... Uh, we would meet, we would go to dinner, we would listen to what the management company would say okay. without any independent investigation on our part. Yes. When they left, we discovered that the conditions were horrendous. Yes. And since that time, we have been able to uh, identify a developer. Yes. Uh, and right now, we are working on an $84 million renovation wow. for the entire uh, development. Wow. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's exciting. It, it, it should be. And so by you being the president there, you're going to bring to bear a lot of the concerns from the Poor People's Campaign as well. Well, uh, there, there's a synergy there, yes. Kevin, because uh, I would say maybe 98 percent of the okay. residents at Kingsbury Towers receive some type of subsidy Got you. to supplement their rental payment. Yes. The, uh, the market rate uh, that's uh, suggested by um, HUD, yes. uh, it's right now about $1,500 a month. Um, <laughs> wow. But it's my understanding that uh, there's not a resident who is, has received a voucher that pays more than $200 a wow. month. Wow, you know, wow. So it, it's, a and, sub, it's a subsidized project. And how many units do you have there? Um, right now we have 304 units okay. in the two towers. Okay. Uh, we had 60 units of what we refer to as low rises. Yes. Uh, it was a two-story um a portion of the development, okay. But we found that they were uh, they were beyond um, recovery, okay. beyond redemption. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, and most of our problems with the infrastructure emanated from those units. So the plan is that they will be demolished, uh, and in that footprint, um, plans are being discussed for the construction of a health care facility. Okay, it's in the very preliminary stages right okay. now. Okay. Now, keeping in that same track, because you are the president, you also serve on another board where you're also the president. Let's let's talk about that as well. Oh, great! Uh, <laughs> I like that. Uh, the the Maker's Place. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a, a initiative of the uh, Greater New Jersey Annual Conference of yes. the United Methodist Church. Yes. And about five years ago, in terms of developing a ministry that would meet people at their point of need. Yes. It was determined that the the cost of Pampers for low and moderate income people is a major portion of their budget. So um, a a ministry, if you will, yes. of, of distributing Pampers free of charge was, yes. was started. And in fact, it started at my church, at the church, Turning Point United Methodist Church. Yes. Uh, about six months ago, I was invited to that board and now I'm the of the interim president, and okay. we're seeking uh, to continue that ministry, and we're seeking to expand the footprint of that ministry because we're finding that um, Pampers are expensive. Now watch this. Now watch this. Just to show how connected you are, you already know where I'm going. Some of the members from Kingsbury, don't they receive diapers? Absolutely. From Maker's Place? Yes, they do. Well, yes, see, they do. Okay. So there, there's a, a, a synergistic effect. You know, and, qu and quite frankly, you know, as a pastor of a United Methodist Church, uh, the Methodist Church was founded by John Wesley. And yes. one of John Wesley's major uh, legacies was that he firmly believed that the ministry of the church should take place in the community. Yes. That worship was important, but the, the real expression of Christian love and Christian concern is what is being done in the streets. In fact, he's one of the first street street pastors. Wow. Which is, uh, even though he was an Ang Anglican priest, he saw the need to meet people at their point of need. Now, now you ready for this one? Go ahead. Keeping with John Wesley's theory, mm -hmm. let's talk about the urban ministry that you do in terms of outreach. Let's talk about that, Pastor. You know, you, know, you, you talk about... Now, well, so you mentioned that you were the president of these 
boards. Correct. Let's talk about the other boards that you sit on that you can also provide some type of urban ministry towards. Okay. Let's talk about that. Now, we're going to talk about it. I just want to uh, make the point that I find that my work outside of the church <laughs> is an extension yes. of my ministry. Yes. You know, where, uh, yes, we have traditional worship, we have uh, remote worship, but uh, we have, we maintain a feeding ministry. Yes. Every Wednesday at about 4 o'clock, we distribute 300 meals yes. in conjunction with the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, yeah. of which I'm on the board. But also, but also tell them that the Soup Kitchen began at our church. Soup Kitchen is approximately 41 years old. Yes. In the first two years, uh, the Soup Kitchen, the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen, yes. where Task, as it's known now, was started at 15 South. Broad Street in yes. New Jersey, yep. which is uh, where uh, Turning Point, the church, is located. Yep. Now, you keep saying Turning Point. Why Why the name Turning Point, Pastor? Turning Point, that's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> first off, um, First Methodist Episcopal Church yes. uh, began in 1772. Yes. That is the is arguably the oldest Methodist church in the state of New Jersey. Yes, and arguably the fourth or fifth oldest in the entire country. Yes, it came a time in the uh, late '90s, early 2000s that First Methodist, you know, First United Methodist Church merged okay. with St. Paul United Methodist yes. Church, um, which was located at 505 South South. Um, I'm sorry, 505 West State Street. Yes. Uh, and when the churches came together, it was determined that we should have a new name. And I wasn't a pastor at the time, but I'm told that a member suggested the name Turning Point. Okay. Uh, acknowledging the fact that the Revolutionary War Battle of Trenton was is seen as a turning point. Yes. In this country's um, battle for independence. Um, and... To name the church Turning Point, that's a recognition that this church should be, should represent an opportunity for a turning point yes. in the lives of the residents here in the city of Trenton. Now, keeping keeping with Turning Point and keeping with the food ministry, right, on Wednesdays, what else or what's the other ministry of, of feeding do you do on Saturdays? Let's talk about that real yeah. quick. On, on Saturdays, in conjunction with... Uh, Urban Grace yes. uh, and an organization called Showing Up for Racial Justice or Surge, uh, we feed uh, in excess of 150, sometimes in excess of 200 yes. uh, hot meals on Saturday morning. Yes. Um, and that's one of the, uh, I think, diamonds in our ministry because even during COVID when we could not serve indoors, yes. uh, we served upwards of 175 to 200 meals out of doors. Yes. You know, uh, it was a little cold at times. Sometimes it was raining, but uh, it has been a consistent staple in yes. the lives of, uh, of our neighbors. And it's an expression, we see it as an expression of Christ's love. We see all of our ministries as a tangible yes. expression of Christ's love. It's okay. one thing for someone to see someone who's hungry and say to them, I'm going to pray for you. you know, <laughs> yeah. That sounds good, but if you're not getting the wrinkles out of somebody's stomach, exactly, that's, mean, that's meaningless. Exactly. Now, same thing with our uh, clothing ministry. Okay. About once a month, we we distribute clothing okay. um, for both men, women, and children at our church. Same thing. If you see someone, you know, cold, you know, uh, no shoes. Yes. You know, they need a coat. Yes. It's one thing to say, "I'm going to pray for you." Yes. But. If you got a coat, you got to get the, you got to get them a coat. Absolutely, you know? absolutely, um, absolutely. I'm reminded um, as a as a intersection of our faith and of a practical uh, application of that faith. Yes. Back in 1964, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes, uh, she's a black woman in the Mississippi uh, delegation for the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. Okay, and there was a hubbub because they were not allowing black people to sit to become delegates okay. um, down in Atlantic City and her famous quote uh, because she was a person of strong Christian uh, values she yes. said um, after you pray you have to get up and do something yes 
all too often in, the, in our Christian life, we say, well, let's just pray to see what the Lord is going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's just, I'll pray for you that you can get a coat. I'll pray, I'll be praying for you. I know you're hungry, yeah. but I'm going to pray for yeah. you. <laughs> You know, the Bible that I read encourage, obligates us mm -hmm. that if you profess to be a follower of, of Jesus Christ, you're supposed to do something. You've got to put it in action. Absolutely. You know. Now, did we cover the additional work that you do with Mercer Street? <laughs> no, Pat, we didn't. Let, let me tell you something, Pastor. And I, I, I would often tease you, and I would tell you that our church, we're small in number. Mm -hmm. But you have to be the most active pastor, certainly in Trenton. And we appreciate you for that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but I, I say in, in church all the time, Kevin. Yes. Because you and I both ex-D1 football players. Yes. You went to Pittsburgh. I only went to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> but I can still claim. But you're smarter than I, though. Well, that's debatable. <laughs> But, you know, you could be the best quarterback, and I consider myself the quarterback. Okay. And you can be the best quarterback in the world, but if you don't have a team yes. to block, to carry the ball, to catch the ball, yes. you're just going to be a good quarterback. Okay. You know, so when people are congratulating or say, oh, Pastor, you're doing a lot, you know, you're doing a lot in the community, it's only because of the team at turning point. Okay. And there are times when I wish we had a deeper roster, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, because we're we're small in number. But yes. I'm also reminded that uh, Jesus Christ only had twelve. Only had twelve, and one of them was shaky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, let's let's go back to that, and let's let's really talk about uh, your work with Task. Mm -hmm. You sit on their board. Let's talk about your work with uh, Mercer Street because you were recently appointed to their board. That, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, first with Mercer Street for for about four years now, we have been a um, recipient of yes. their their food bank. Yes. Uh, where once a month uh, we get a delivery of groceries, which we then distribute okay. in our part of Trenton. Um, because of our involvement at Turning Point, because as a faith leader, yes. members of the board, which is a Quaker organization, saw the connection between spirituality and practicality of feeding. Yes, um, they invited me to join the board. And and how many how many meals in terms of grocery bags are we providing? Uh, each month we provide between we service about 150 to sometimes 200 families. Okay, okay, you know that sort of thing. Do we want to shout out anybody at Mercer Street, Pastor? Uh, at this point, it's <laughs> Bernie and, and my friend Butter. Okay, okay. Yeah, and my friend Pam. The, oh, yeah, Pam. I better, I better, you got to keep Pam paying me. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, yes. sir. Yes. So, so you, you started talking about Penn. Let's take a break from the ministry, mm -hmm. and let's talk about how you became a minister. Let's talk about that. Let's take us, take us back to the beginning. So here you are. You're a young man. You're going to University of Pennsylvania. You're at the Wharton School. Were you thinking about... 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I'm going to be a pastor. When did when did the decision become uh, for you to become a pastor? How did that happen? Well, uh, in June of 1966, <laughs> uh, it was the occasion at my church in, in Pasadena, Maryland, uh, Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Ms. Marion Cass looked at me and said, okay. you're going to be a pastor. Okay. And, you know, our, our, our matrons say things like that, yes. and I just totally dismissed it. Yes. Um, I went to college. Uh, I graduated, and that calling was still there. Yes. You know, however, um, I didn't want to be a pastor. Got you. Uh, after, after I graduated from college, I was a commercial banker, and then while I was a commercial banker, I went to law school. Okay. And I graduated and I started practicing law in 1982. Okay. 1983. Okay. And the calling was still there, but as United Methodists, uh, we serve, uh, at the pastors, elders serve at the whim of the bishop, meaning okay. you will have a church, but if the if the bishop says you go to East Blip, yeah, you go to East Blip. Yes. I didn't want that. Yes. So I, I was on the track to become a deacon in the United Methodist okay. Church. As a deacon, uh, you are ordained 
but you're not subject to what we refer to as itinerancy. Okay. Fast forward to 2013, um, my district superintendent uh, said to me, would you like to be a pastor? Okay. And the fleshly part of me said, no. Yeah. <laughs> but the spiritual part said, now look at the calendar. I have more years behind me yes. than I have ahead of me. Yes. I better say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, although I had been in ministry uh, as a lay person for many years, serving in various capacities, uh, in April of, of 2013, okay. I accepted the call to be a pastor. And okay. For the first three years, uh, I was a pastor at Groveville United Methodist yeah. Church. Stop for a second. Go ahead. I would, I would come and see you sometimes. Tell us that story about Groveville and tell us about their pastor. Mm -hmm. Right, because it, it had a connection with the KKK, right? Well, <laughs> historically, yes. Groveville's part of Hamilton Township. Yes. And in the 30s and the 20s and the 30s, in Hamilton Township, I'm told that they had a higher uh, population of the Ku Klux Klan than some southern states. Wow. And that there were members... Um, uh, fathers and grandfathers at Groveville United Methodist Church Yes, uh, that would leave the trustee meeting at the <laughs> church and go to the Klan meeting. <laughs> but God is a miracle-working God. Yes. I was there for three years. Yes. And in the third year, we were celebrating Black History Month. Wow. Wow, Pastor. And when uh, I left that church, uh, they didn't want me to go. Okay. Because we acknowledge each other's humanity. Yes. And when we sat down, uh, I knew more about them than they knew about me. Yes. You know, and if you start dealing with people where they are, yes. understanding the context from which they came. Yes. And not allow their uh, their historicity. Yes. You know, to affect you know, their con con contemporary. Um, dealings, yes. then pro progress can be made. Excellent. Okay? Excellent. Yes. Be but if you bring the historicity to the table for today, that stymies, that stymies interaction and that stymies conversation yes. and that stymies um, the togetherness that's needed and the unity that's needed uh, along racial lines. Now, is there something you would like to do different in your ministry? or you like the progress that you've made thus far? I am thankful for the progress. Okay. Um, there are times, however, on Sunday morning, I look out and I don't see uh, our church that could hold up to 400 people. Yes. I would love to have that filled. Yes. But I also believe that God prepares you for what he has in store for you. Yes. And you are, we are called to be fruitful where you are. Yes. Um, we're looking down the road, you have expectations, you have desires, but um, if you focus on where you are yes, and do the best that you can and let God take care of the rest, you know, in the book of Acts, uh, when the church was just beginning, uh, it's very important to me to read that at that time, people were coming to the church. They were all on one accord. Yes. And it was like the three musketeers, one for all and all for, all yeah, for yeah. one. Yeah. But the Bible says that they increase because of God. Yes. You know, so man, you can't, you just got to do what he tells you to do. Yes. And he'll bring the increase. So you asked me if there's anything. Um, you would like to do different. I would like to do different. Yes. At this point, no. Okay. Just to do what I'm doing better. Okay. You know, okay. and do what I'm doing more in reliance on um, the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Because I am an Ivy League educated former attorney. Yes. And intellectually, I can hold my own with just about anybody. Absolutely. But as a Christian, we got to get behind the cross yes. and let the Lord take the wheel. And you failed to mention that you have a wonderful voice, Pastor. So, you know, before we end this conversation, I'm going to ask you to sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to, let me call my agent first. Okay, okay. okay. I hear you. Now, I think I think we've covered a lot, but I want to um, just ask you: Is there anything else that you think we need to cover? Is there any other points that we need to hit a little harder? 
because I know I know what's really on your heart. Well, I really don't know what's really on your heart, mm-hmm. but I know in preparation for this, you really wanted to talk about the Poor People's Campaign. Right. So I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about that. And I also want to talk about the the other outreach uh, of efforts that the church is doing as well. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about the Poor People's Campaign, which uh, sometimes gets lost in the sauce, yes. is that Martin Luther King had as his foundation uh, his Christianity. Yes, and the work that he did uh, emanated out of his strong faith yes. and his strong belief that he was put here, you know, for the betterment of God's people. Got you. And a lot of times, even in efforts such as the Poor People's Campaign, we can lose sight of that. Yes. Dr. Barber is a pastor for about 35 years in okay. a small town in North Carolina, but he has never lost sight of that. Okay. That... Um, uh, there, there is a connection between the plight of, of poor and oppressed people yes. with the Bible because my Bible tells me that Jesus wasn't born into a rich, kingly family. Yes, you know, um, at the time of his birth, you know, they were homeless. Wow, yeah, you're right. You're true. You're true. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And and there, 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 there is a synergy there. Yes, um, that uh, when. He rode into Jerusalem as we just entered Lent. That he didn't ride in on a big white horse, yes. you know, with a spear and a sword. He rode in on a donkey. Yes. You know, so here we are in 2024, trying and making sure that we um, see the connection between um, where Jesus was, yes, who Jesus went to, yes. And if we claim that we want to be like Jesus, yes. We got to go. We still have some of those same people. Absolutely. The, and he also tells us that the poor we always have with us. Yes. So uh, the poor people are there. Now, now when you talk about the Poor People's Campaign, uh, how are the other ministers, the uh, your other colleagues, how are they responding to you and the work that you do with the Poor People's Campaign? The here in Trenton, we we are. Getting the word out. Okay. Quite frankly, the Poor People's Campaign in New Jersey um, has had sort of a torturous history. Yes. You know, but now over the last, I would say, five weeks, okay. um, there are ministers that are coming alongside. There are okay. uh, very active ministers in, in the street, you know. Yes. Uh, Pastor Karen Hernandez. Yes. You know, Reverend Charles Wilkins. Yes. Are, are two of the uh, strong people of the community. Of yes. The, of the committee right now. Excellent. Um, there are some uh, pastors who have been in Trenton a lot longer than, than we have. Yes. And it's my belief that once they understand what the Poor People's Campaign is about. Yes. Because the messaging has been mixed over the last four or okay. five years. Okay. That they will come along also. Okay. Okay. Now, let's let's go back to highlight that date again as to when these this 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 march is going to take place. This activity, this event. The, uh, the march and the rally will take place on March second. Okay. Uh, on March second, uh, we will be congregating at Mill Hill Park. Yes. At the corner of Broad and Front Street. Yes. And we will be leaving on the march at about ten thirty in the morning. Okay. Walking uh, on down State Street down okay. to the State House. Okay. Even though it's going to be closed, we're going to have a rally. Where we're going to have a series of speakers. Okay. Um, and we're not going to solve the ills on that day. There yes. are some people, even on the committee, that expect us to go down and solve all the problems on that day. Got you. No, the purpose of that rally is to be part of a nationwide event yes. because at that same time uh, uh, there will be other groups of the Poor People's Campaign walking okay. to their individual state okay. capitals. But they will be, um, there will be people speaking, there will be uh, faith leaders, yes. but most importantly there will be people who have been impacted, people um, that may have been suffering through homelessness, gotcha. people who may have been suffering from food insecurity, yes. people who may have been uh, suffering from a lack of, of health care. Yes. You know, they will also be speaking. Yes. Not long and drawn out, but uh, we consider this to be just a jumping off point. Okay. After the, the rally on March 4th on Monday, Tuesday, Okay. Uh, we'll be going to the State House and delivering um, our demands okay. with regards to poor and low-income people to the okay. various legislators. Excellent. And some meetings have already been set up for that. Now, people, as as they may watch this or listen to this, 
they're asking this question. Pastor, you do so much and you minister to so many people. How and who ministers to you? How and who ministers to me? Yes. Number one, um, the easy theological answer <laughs> is the, the Holy Spirit ministers to me. Okay. That's number one. Okay. Um, after that, my wife of 43 years. Yes. Um, the lovely Ann Boney Hall. Yes. And Our after first lady, yes. First lady. And after that, my four-year-old grandson, okay. Noah. Okay. Noah Arvell. Okay. Uh, he's a precocious little tyke. He's smart beyond his years. Okay. But while you're doing for other people, number one, you got to make sure you take care of yourself. Absolutely. And number two, you got to take care of your family. Yes. All too often, I've witnessed how um, ministers and pastors have neglected their families. Yes. In in serving the church. Okay. But I tell everyone at, at Turning Point when they have a family issue that God ordained family first yes. before He ordained church. Yes. So I don't want to hear. Um, I didn't. I didn't go to my child's birthday party because I had to go to a board meeting at church. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Um, but I also have some interests. I, I, I play at golf. Yes. You, know, that's you what play it's like. at golf. I, I play at, I have a good time. I yeah. enjoy myself. Yeah. And I enjoy myself in uh, restoring a, a 1991 Corvette. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, which uh, is coming along quite well. Yeah. Now, the, now, the, now the, the part that I like about you, Pastor, is... You're showing the human side because most of the time when people talk about pastors or ministers, mm -hmm. they think about there's this guy or woman that's very steep religiously mm -hmm. and they have to walk around with this profound religious uh, effect mm -hmm. about them. But you are you are down home. Right. And you speak to the urban ministry. Now, let's talk about that. What's the difference between urban ministry and just normal ministry? <laughs> right, and, and this may make some folks upset, but I want them to know that there's a difference. There isn't a difference. Okay. There should not be a difference. Okay, we've created the difference. Yes, uh, because in um, church circles and society circles, yes, you use the word urban as a code word for black, brown, yes. and poor. Yes. Okay, and. There's a certain dehumanizing effect yes. of that label okay. because it suggests that the people who live in urban America have problems that are different than the people that live in Princeton yes. or Heightstown yes. or Pennington. Yes. Now, on the economic level, yes, there are differences, but as individuals, they, they're suffering from the same pain. Absolutely. They're suffering from the same hurt. Yes. They're suffering from trauma. It may be different trauma, yes. but it's trauma nonetheless. But in urban America, in urban ministry, there's a greater need for people to see who Jesus really was. Yes. In urban America, we have to um, celebrate the fact that most of Jesus' work was in the streets. Yes. And that most of Jesus' work was dealing with people who were considered undesirable. Yes. Most of the people that Jesus screamed about and criticized and had strong words against them yes. were church folk. Because <laughs> gotcha. he would always rail against the duplicitous nature, yes. the hypocrisy demonstrated by by church folk. Yes. You know, they call them the Pharisees and Sadducees. But in urban in, in the urban setting, first off, you have to meet the people where they are. Okay. And a lot of times that means talking to somebody in the street outside. Yes. He may have a 40 in his hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you have to tell them, look, we want to talk, you know, you can, I can't talk to you while you're drinking a 40. Yes. We got something, something's got to go. Yes. You know, but you still talk, you still respect Absol their humanity. Absolutely. You know, you still, and, and that's the part I think that's different. It's yeah. so easy to dismiss people. And you do that well, Pastor. Well, I, I pray a lot. Yeah, you do that but well. But it's easy to dismiss people who don't look like you, who are not on the same economic level as you. They don't smell like you. Yes. And they sometimes, there's a little fear because they're they're aggressive. Yes. But we don't know. I, 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 I practice a theology that everyone of God's children, there's no one on the face of this earth that's ever been born 
that has not been given a spark of the divine. Yes. And in urban ministry, our goal is to find that spark of the divine in yes. everyone. Yes. Now, in looking for that spark of the divine, you gotta you gotta be careful yeah. because uh, <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff in there with that spark yes. of the divine, and you gotta be yes. ready. But it's there nonetheless. Yes. Um, we had a, had an incident two weeks ago. I was speaking to this brother at at the um, breakfast, and he we talked we talked downstairs in the, in the uh, fellowship hall. Yes. And after that. I was verbally attacked by a female who called me everything but a child of God. Wow. She was, she, she had substance issues. She had some, some mental issues. Okay. That morning, I was her target. Wow. And I had prayed a lot because, you know, I'm a pastor, but when people start attacking you, you yes. got to say, Lord, help me to yes. be like you in this moment. Yes. But let me tell you what happened. Uh, I went back, I came upstairs to my office. This gentleman came up. He said, Pastor, I want to apologize okay. for how she treated you. I want to apologize to you. He didn't know the woman, but okay. he saw he saw the incident. And we kept talking, we kept talking. And he said, uh, I said, what's your name? He said, and I can't remember the full name, but the last part of it was Kush. Okay. It was a, a very Afrocentric name. Yes. And... He said, I'm an author. Okay. And he didn't look like an author. Okay. Um, he didn't even talk like an author. Yes. He said, but yeah, I'm an author. I have a book, Barnes & Noble. Okay. And I said, okay, that's easy enough. So right there, I just, yeah. I dialed him up. And sure enough. Wow. His book. Wow. Was being sold on Amazon. Wow. And it's about, I think the title of it was, the souls of burnt people, something along those lines. Wow! And my point is, you never know. Yes. Who what a who a person is. Yes. Until you sit down and talk with them. Yes. Um, one of the things, another another revolutionary thing that I like to practice in in the urban ministry in Trenton, I like to do something extremely extremely revolutionary when people are standing in line for either groceries or standing in line for a hot meal, yes. just to walk up to them and say, what's your name? Yes. And when, a, when you ask a person what their name is, yes. you are letting them know you see them as a person. Yes. Because a person's name is some one of the most personal um, indicia of who they are. Yes. And they're not just another number. Mm -hmm. They're not just another homeless person, not yes. just another uh, person looking for a free meal. Yes. Just by asking. And when you ask somebody their name, you'll see a change in their demeanor. Yes. You know, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, and you ask their name enough, you establish a relationship. Yes. And once you establish a relationship, they'll be willing, more apt to listen to what you have to Absolutely. say about the gospel. Absolutely. You know, that Absolutely. sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah. Pastor, you have a lot going on, and uh, I, I want to thank you. I mean, well, first of all, is there anything else you want to highlight, anything else you want to share with us? Because I'm still going to uh, ask you to sing a song before we go. So maybe maybe think about singing a song or a few okay. bars of a song, right? And then we'll, we'll conclude that way, Pastor. Okay. I uh, thank for it today. Uh, <laughs> this is good. Like, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yes. And this has been a lot less stressful than I had, had yes. anticipated. Yes. Okay. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you. 
You're welcome. This has been a wonderful conversation, and uh, this is going to be a blessing to so many. So thank you once again. Thank you for having me. Okay. Okay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That concludes another episode of The Entrepreneurial Enclave with Kevin Wortham. The podcast that focuses on building, maintaining, pivoting, planning, and investing in you, the entrepreneur. We hope you found this episode informative and enlightening. If you have any questions or comments about any of our episodes, please call 609-731-9311 or email kevin at minding-our-business.com We look forward to joining us for our next one. Until next time.